and it was uh, published by Sobolev in 38, and we, all, we know a lot about them. We know the optimizers, uh, which are uh, given in, the, in this equation here. We, we know the best constants, and uh, et cetera. And so the, 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 general, the Galeardo linear mean inequalities are a generalization of the Sobolev inequalities, and a particular simple, I mean, the, the, the general class of, of equation is more general than what I have written here. And so it's, it, they connect the LQ norms of U with the LP norms of the gradient of U and the U, EP norm of U. For <coughs> there are several uh, parameters here. They are connected through this uh, equation here. And here there is a typo when alpha is equal to one. It should say the, the Galeano linear inequality is reduced to the sole inequalities that we all know. Earlier, <coughs> earlier this year there was a very nice uh, review. Uh, of the of the Galeano linear inequalities, the, the history, and it's published in the uh, Journal of Analysis and Application. Uh, they were first introduced in in the 1958 International Congress of Mathematicians uh, Congress in Edinburgh, and uh, it was very uh, it was a serendipity that both were presenting at the same time in the same session, Galeano Nirnberg. And they presented two talks introducing these things, and the first publication on them came later. Uh, later, there is a misprint here. It's 57, 59, sorry. And Gagliardo and Nirnberg published their results that they presented in Edinburgh. And in in one dimension, there were previous inequalities of this type by Adamart in the 19th century, at the final, at the end of 19th century, and Bella Nagy in 1941. Uh, also, in the same Congress, in the International Congress of Mathematicians in Edinburgh, uh, was present Olga Ladishinskaya, and she presented a particular case of the Galeano linear mean inequalities in the same session, and she had proven uh, she had proven this inequality here uh, in order to show the uh, global existence of solutions to the navier stokes equation in two dimensions. So the, the whole family, particular set of Galeano linear mean inequalities with these coefficients in dimension three and uh, dimension three and dimension two with this, this par parameter s, they are they are called Ladishinskaya inequalities. So they are the first used in physics of the Galeano linear mean inequalities. In the best for the best constants for the Galeano linear mean inequalities, I have a summary here in, in dimension one, when the exponent is six and q is six and p is equal to two. There is this inequality with a sharp constant here. And in the case alpha equal one, as I said before, for any dimension bigger than three, bigger or equal to three is the solving inequalities, and we know a lot about them. In a particular case of these parameters, Del Pino, Manuel Del Pino and Jan Dolbo, they proved in 2002 the sharp constant for these inequalities. And in their case, as in many other cases, the, the, the minimizers are given by this condition here. Uh, and in what follows, I will be particularly interested in, in the subclass of, of Galeano linear mean inequalities here by, by a special set of parameters here, where alpha is given by this constant here. And, 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 and what I would, and, and, and not even that, I will just get a, a line of inequalities when this parameter rho satisfies this, this inequality here. So you can forget this transparency here. What I'm really interested in is the, this particular subset of inequalities. So we are going to minimize, uh, we take the infimum of the, of the L2 norm of the gradient, the L2 norm of, of the function u in, in the whole Rn divided by this constant here. And this sort of, uh, you, this uh, norm here. And this n is the, is the dimension of the space. And as, as I mentioned before, in the, when the dimension is one, the, the best constant here is known, is pi squared over four. This is related with the Lipschitz inequalities in part, in, in, for example. And in the case n equal two, uh, in the case n equal two was precisely the case considered by Olga Radishinskaya in 1958. And the best constant for any m bigger equal to two, except for the for the case alpha equal one, except for the sublimit inequalities, are not even there. They are not known. Uh, the, 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 the best constant, I mean, not the sharp constant, but the, the best bounds obtained up to date had, were obtained in 1989 by Nasibo. 
and he was using a connection found by earlier by Michael Weinstein in 1983 between the, the uh, Gagliardo nearby inequalities and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So he used that and lots of other techniques in a very nice paper in 1989 to, to have their, the best, the, the best, not the sharp constant, but the best constant so far. And in, in 2011, Rupert Frank, Douglas Lundholm, and Jan Philip Soloway in a series of papers used the romance method to obtain simple bounds for the linear, for the linear like, solid constant. The, the method is really simple. I mean, they don't obtain the best constant so far, but it, it is the simplest method to obtain constant up to date. And what I am really interested in is the, the, the same set of inequalities. I mean, this in the infimum that I am taking here in the equation one, but for the particular case when the domain is bounded. So uh, this is the object of interest to us. So G of omega n is the infimum of the L2 norm of gradient U in the, in, the bound, in the domain omega. And this is the two norm of U in the domain omega. And since we're using free boundary conditions, we have to take, in order for this whole thing to make sense, we subtract here in the bottom, the average of the function in the domain. So U of omega is the average of the function in the domain. And in, part, in, the, in a particular case we are interested in because of applications to the lip trimming inequalities is the case of the hypercube when omega is equal to zero one of omega. And in that case, uh, we, we instead of using here omega, we just say GQ of U for the hypercube. So G of Q of, of U is the, is the corresponding infimum here taken, I mean, this is taken in W11 of omega, but when the domain is a cube. And the main results are listed here. The main results we obtained like a year ago are listed here. If the domain of omega, which is a bounded domain in Rn, is smooth enough and smooth enough for us is C3, and then we have existence of minimizers of this quotient. Uh, also, in the case when the domain is not uh, sufficiently smooth, a, a particular example, for example, are the elongated rectangles. If the, if the rectangles are sufficiently elongated, and I will say how, what, does, what does that mean, then we have the, the proof of exist, I mean, we have existence of minimizers. Also, in dimension, uh, this is in dimension two for elongated rectangles. In dimension higher dimension, if the dimension is high enough and our bound is not sharp at all, if n is bigger or equal to 10, we prove that there, is, that there, 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 there are minimizers for the hypercubes. So in these three cases, it's sufficiently smooth, elongated rectangles in R2, and hypercubes in Rn for a very high dimension, we have existence of minimizers for this thing with free boundary condition. And in the, but also we have a non-existence of minimizers in the domain is, I mean, it's not as smooth, uh, surely, in a particular example when you have an isosceles rectangular triangle. And uh, we have several lemmas which are, uh, which take care of the concentration of the solution. Uh, so for all in, in dimension bigger one, equal to one, we, we can compare the quotient for the, for the hypercube with the quotient for the whole space. And this always G of Q of N is less or equal than G of N of Four, and this is the proof. You, you put the, the hypercube, the, hyper, the rectangles or the hypercubes together, and you and you center in one of the corners, and you put uh, the over. I mean, you you put the, a concentration of the minimizing in the whole space. And in particular, in one dimension, we we can prove that there is no. I mean, and, and also we have a, a concentration compactness argument, argument. If g of q of n is less, strictly less than that, there is min, a minimizer. If it is equal, then there is no minimizer. In particular, in dimension one, there is no minimizer, and the G cube for the cube, the best constant is pi squared over 16. And as I said, if the dimension it doesn't exist, if the minimizer doesn't exist, we have that thing. This is by using concentration compactness. And the, the proof of the existence of minimizer for a smooth domain uses concentration compactness. We see it in order to prove we have a, we use the trial function for the, for the, for the quotient. We sit it on the, on a point, on a smooth point of the domain where, where the curvature is strictly positive. We set up a straight line there and we compare the solution to the solution to the whole space by thinking that the whole space is contained by two uh, half spaces here. 
And if we, after a whole calculation, we prove that we have the, we can compare the G of omega is strictly less than what it should be. And using concentration compactness, we prove existence. Uh, for this, uh, for the for in, in the case of for the isosceles rectangular triangle, we have no non-existent, and in in fact, in that case, we we satisfy this condition here. For the proof of the non-existence of the, of the solution uh, of the of the isosceles triangle, which is the only case except for dimension one, in dimension one, uh, for the hypercube, which is just a, a, an interval. Uh, we, we, we don't have existence of solutions. And, and the only other case where we have non-existence of solutions is the isosceles uh, re, uh, right triangle. And in the proof uh, proceeds using symmetry. We have, a, we assume that there is a minimizer for the whole triangle, for the triangle A, B, C. And we decompose, I mean, we, we throw the, the perpendicular here to the hypotenusa. And then we have two uh, similar triangles here, which are also similar to the, the first triangle, to the whole triangles. There are isosceles right triangles on their own right. And we write U as the symmetric part with respect to this line, and the anti-symmetric part with respect to this line. And since the average of U is equal to zero and the average of the anti-symmetric portion is zero, then the average of US is, C S is zero, the symmetric part. And we use the symmetric, the, the symmetric part of U as a trial function for the smallest triangle. And we and we use energy estimate and we show that if there is exists a solution in the for the big triangle, this US is going to give us a better bound than what it should be. And since they are similar, this is a, a, this is a contradiction. And also, uh, as I said before, when you have a, 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 a in two dimensions, when you have a rectangle of volume one, I mean, the volume here is relevant because you have invariance and the scaling. And so when you have a volume one and P is the aspect ratio, if the aspect ratio is lower is, is lower than 2.12, and maybe we can do better, then this minimizes uh, uh, do exist. But for the cube, for the square, we don't know. I mean, it's a big open problem to know whether for the square we have a solution or not. And also, if the dimension is high enough, then there is a minimizer. And the last thing I wanted to, I have a one minute, and the last thing I wanted to say is that we can consider the whole, uh, the, the same uh, problem, but now in the in omega, in omega bounded, but now uh, instead of you being uh, satisfying free boundary conditions, satisfy, satisfies uh, directly boundary condition. And uh, using the standard relic pocosai technique, we can prove that if omega, this, this domain of omega is star shaped, then there is no minimizer of this quantity here, which is the similar condition, the similar thing that you get in the sublevel inequality with the critical sublevel exponent. And you can also perturb this problem with the linear perturbation, and you can generate the resist Nierenberg pro a similar thing as the resist Nierenberg problem in the whole for the whole uh, class of solutions here. And this is what we're working on now. So thank you very much. I think I am right on time. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this wonderful talk. So I don't know if there are any questions in the room. Maybe we should start there. I, I don't see questions right now. Okay. I I have a question. Um, so, uh, do you know what is the asymptotic for the hypercube as n goes to infinity? Does it approach the uh, upper bound? Yeah, it does. I mean, we can prove that. In fact, we, you can prove that using uh, Roman's techniques. Yeah, we can prove that. I forgot what the. I, I don't have it here in, in my written here the the the, the symmetric thing. But yeah, it, it converges. Yeah. Thank you. We have still time for some questions. There is one in the room. Maybe you can turn off the microphone. Yes, uh, I'm not sure I understood why the power must be a four over n. Uh, why is the power four over n? Yes. Uh, uh, this is a particular case of the. I mean, it, it could be more general. But when when you have this class, this is the class, the larger class considered by by 
by uh, Nasibo. And here uh, there is a, a, a line where, I mean, when rho is, sorry, there is a particular case, which is, which is the one we're considering. But you don't have to consider that case. We, you can consider something more general than that. But that's, I mean, the reason we consider that is because that's the one, I mean, we started working on this problem because of NAMP's paper in general function in in 2017, when he was trying to prove the uh, Lipchevin conjecture for the kinetic energy of, of fermions. And he was using the localization techniques and he was decomposing the, the space in the small cubes. And, and we wanted to compute the, con the, the error term that he had in, in his problem. So that's why we consider this particular case. We were not, you can consider more general than that. So thank you very much for your question. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? No more question on site. Okay, so maybe uh, we can close the question session. So thank you very much, Rafael, for uh, that. And now we move to speakers on site. So may I? Chair, may I? So the speaker is uh, the speaker is ready on site. If you oh, the speaker is ready, I, I'm, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, yes, Sorry. right. Can we have a camera on the speaker? <laughs> no, right now uh, it's better. Yes. Uh, nice to see you, Pavel. So never, uh, never mind. I am here. <laughs> So the, <laughs> the next speaker is uh, uh, Pavel Exner from the uh, uh, Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague, and uh, he will speak on uh, Dirichlet Laplace in spiral shaped regions. Okay, Please. thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, what I'm going to report is a common work with uh, Miroš Tatera. And uh, uh, as an introduction, there, there were many results about uh, Dirichlet Laplacians in various uh, tube shape regions. Uh, there were many interesting connections found between the spectral properties and the geometry. But I'm going here to uh, discuss one class which uh, so far escaped attention, uh, which is um, uh, uh, regions, two dimensional regions, which uh, have a spiral uh, shape. Um, uh, there are several reasons why uh, uh, one should be interested in that. Uh, first, to uh, illustrate that uh, the spectrum uh, spectrum uh, can change substantially if you do something which <coughs> globally is something you may not recognize. As an uh, as an example, just take in the plane the system of concentric circles on which you put uh, Dirichlet condition. So the spectrum of such a system is. Uh, uh, is um, uh, starts from the first transverse eigenvalue, it's pure point, dense pure point, and below the threshold you have an infinite series of eigenvalues. Now if you replace uh, these circles by an Archimedean spiral, which away of the center looks very much similar, you will see that the spectrum is completely different. But there is also a physic, uh, physical motivation because uh, in physics uh, spiral shaped as uh, regions appear frequently. Here's just a random random choice, uh, say, uh, guides for cold atoms. Uh, there are spiral uh, waveguides uh, in electromagnetism in optical system. They're used uh, in applications as detectors and there are uh, spirals in acoustics uh, and many more. So let me, uh, since uh, Archimedes is, uh, appears here many times, so let me take the Archimedean spiral as, as a case study. So the, uh, it is given by the well-known well um, parametrization in polar coordinates. Uh, if you write it in the polar coordinates, the operator is just uh, in a skewed strip uh, in, in the plane. And the particle lives, uh, so Dirichlet is uh, imposed on the spiral and the particle lives in the plane, uh, in the whole plane. Uh, the domain of this, uh, the domain, sorry, 
the domain of this operator is larger than usual Sobolev domain because uh, the spiral has a non-convex point in the boundary. So you have to, you have to add, uh, you have to add, yeah, uh, this singular part, which is uh, certainly well known. Now, uh, such uh, such a Dirichlet Laplacian. Uh, it uh, by a Neumann bracketing, uh, you you will prove that uh, the, its uh, essential spectrum starts at one over two to a square, uh, and the question is whether it can have a discrete spectrum. So in order to have uh, this to happen, uh, you should have such a shifted quadratic form uh, made negative, and it is easy to estimate it by such uh, another form, just estimating the angular part where the p uh, alpha beta is such a thing. But now, using the fact that you have Dirichlet boundaries, you'll find that the contribution to this, this form from the interval from 2 pi to infinity is positive, and the same uh, from the interval between 0 and beta. So the only negative contribution could come from, uh, from a finite interval, which tells you that um, the number of uh, bound states could be at most, uh, at most finite. But uh, as, as I will show, in fact, uh, there are none. Uh, this, uh, this system uh, allows for another uh, parameterization, which is quite useful in, uh, in doing with tubular domains namely uh, coordinates which are called parallel or Fermi. You take the uh, arc lengths of, the, uh, arc lengths of uh, the, the spiral as one variable, and the second measures the orthogonal distance to it. And uh, so you, you have to, uh, for the spiral, you have to express, uh, express it in terms of the angle. That's, that's uh, a textbook uh, formulae. And what is important is the vis, I mean perpendicular vis of, of uh, the, this uh, tubular region. As you see, it is not constant, it's changing with the angle, and here is, uh, here is uh, how it depends uh, on the angle. Now, uh, the, uh, the usual trick when uh, doing this curved strip is that you use these Fermi coordinates to straighten them. You get uh, a, a, a sim more simple region, but the price you pay, the geometry is translated into the coefficients. So if you do it here, uh, so you get an operator on a straight strip, uh, but uh, you get uh, from the transformation an effective potential, which is well known. It is this formula here expressed in terms of the curvature. And in the usual curved strip, this first negative part is responsible for creating the discrete spectrum. But here it, it does not happen, and we will see uh, why, why it is so. Uh, but before that, uh, you can use this coordinate to uh, prove some properties of the spectrum, namely that uh, no, uh, not only the infimum uh, is uh, 1 over 2a square, but um, that uh, the, uh, the essential spectrum covers all this interval. And uh, using the Moore theorem, you check uh, that uh, the spectrum away from the threshold, from the, uh, from the transverse this, um, Dirichlet eigenvalues, is purely absolutely continuous. But now about the, about the discrete spectrum. I said that it is not there, and why is so? Uh, the reason is uh, that the, the width of, this, uh, of the strip is changing. And if you now write the expansion I had before, but uh, to, to uh, several more terms in the expansion, so here you have uh, the effective potential, and here we have uh, the uh, positive contribution to the energy coming from the transverse motion. And since the, the width of the, the, the region is changing, these two, uh, these two, sorry, uh, uh, these two uh, have to be summed. And as, as you see, so uh, here, is the, uh, here is the first term, it's just this, uh, the, uh, the threshold of the essential spectrum. And the next two terms in the expansion are exactly the same with the opposite sign. They, uh, they cancel uh, themselves. And moreover, if you go one, uh, one order farther, then uh, you get, uh, you get um, not a cancellation, but cancellation in the mean. So this uh, indicates that uh, there might not be uh, a discrete spectrum at all. In order to see that, uh, let me now uh, check uh, a modified example. I just erase a part of the spiral. I start, uh, started from not a zero angle, but from some angle beta, 
a positive angle beta. And then, of course, I create a cavity in the middle of, of the region. Now, if the cavity is large enough, of course, uh, this grease spectrum would be there. And um, by a Dirichlet bracketing, I get a, a sufficient condition to have a spectrum. It's, it's an easy exercise. Uh, the, result, uh, the result is here. And uh, you, can, uh, you can now look into. Yeah. Just this again. Oh. That's it. And now we're back again. Back again. Okay. Full screen. Yeah. Great. Good. Okay. So now uh, you, you can look. Uh, you can solve uh, the problem uh, numerically y using finite element methods. And as, as you will see, that uh, eigenvalues, of course, are uh, monotonously decreasing with respect to the uh, radius of the cavity. And you see that uh, the, the estimate was quite rough, uh, gave uh, values three times as it is real. But what is important, uh, below this value, there is nothing, which tells you that the full Archimedean spiral has, of course, no discrete spectrum. Uh, you can, al you can uh, uh, also look how the eigenfunctions look like, the first nine eigenfunctions. Uh, you see that, uh, you see that uh, they are uh, in accordance with the Curran theorem. Actually, the only two, uh, yeah, thank you. Only the first, uh, uh, first two of them are Curran sharp. And you also see that uh, there is nothing in the tails because it's, as we saw, it's a classical forbidden region. Now, uh, another variation is you take a multi-arm spiral. Uh, for example, if you take, uh, in that case, you can prove that, that there is no discrete spectrum, that the spectrum is absolutely continuous away of the thresholds. And if you look at the, uh, at the eigenfunctions, you see that uh, they are now uh, much more similar to the eigenfunctions of, of, uh, of the Laplacian at a disk. But this is not a straight line, this is not a circle, but they are much, much more similar to them simply because the narrow, uh, narrow passages are a higher barrier preventing the particle to spread there. Now, of course, that was just an example, but we have many other spirals, logarithmic, Fermat, Poinsot, Atsema, Fibonacci, Theodorus, Okay, just to, to, uh, to restrict myself, I will consider only those which are C2 smooth. And uh, uh, every such spiral would be, uh, would be uh, characterized by, by the this function as a function of the angle. And I can play the same game now with, uh, as I did with the Archimedean spiral and uh, uh, define the Dirschlal Plassian. And uh, the spiral I will call expanding if the this is growing uh, shrinking if this uh, decreasing, and uh, strictly so if the limits are respectively uh, uh, infinity uh, and zero. And the most important case, or most interesting case, is the spiral which is asymptotically Archimedean. That is, the limit of the vis uh, is some some positive number. Now, for uh, the uh, strictly expanding spiral. Uh, the spectrum is not that interesting. It simply covers the positive, uh, uh, positive real hal uh, half line. Uh, for the strictly shrinking, then you can use again the trick with the parallel coordinates and you prove that the spectrum is, is uh, purely discrete. Here, for example, is an example of the uh, eigenfunctions of the Fermat spiral. And you see again that uh, that's uh, number 7, 15, 20, 7, 42. But what do you see that here, the, the uh, outside of the central area, the solutions have distinctively quasi one dimensional character. But as I said, the most interesting is the asymptotically Archimedean situation, where the limit is, uh, where the limit is a positive number, say A0. Now, uh, as you will see, uh, it is important in which way the asymptotic is reached. So let, uh, let us assume that uh, the, the asymptotic behavior, asymptotic behavior, where is that? Asymptotic be behavior is uh, uh, like that, where the, uh, where the, uh, the, the uh, function determining the asymptotic is some rho. And for simplicity, I will, uh, I will assume that the rho as a power-like asymptotic is decreases with some, uh, with some power gamma. 
And then using these uh, this, um, uh, Fermi coordinates, I can prove, uh, you see, Okay, so you don't see the, the claim is that um, uh, if the, uh, if the, uh, the uh, constant C here is positive, that is, if the asymptotic is reached from below, then the, then the, uh, then the uh, uh, Dirichlet Laplacian has an infinite discrete spectrum. And uh, as, an, as an example, then, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, let us meet Monsieur Fermat and Monsieur Archimedes, uh, take, uh, considering uh, such a, uh, such a, uh, a region given by this spiral, which, uh, which is uh, uh, like Fermat for s small values and uh, like, uh, like asymptotically like Archimedean spiral. And uh, you will, uh, you will uh, of course, easily find the asymptotics. And it is a case where the asymptotics is reached from, from below. Uh, here is the explicit formula for, for the function rho. And then uh, this, according to the theorem I show you, uh, the spectrum is infinite and discrete. And here is, uh, here is the, uh, how it depends on the, uh, on the interpolation parameter. Now, <coughs> I should say that uh, uh, all the physics paper I showed you had Archimedes in the title. But what physicists uh, consider Archimedean spiral is not an Archimedean spiral, because what they do, they took something which I fixed with and coil it. It is not Archimedean spiral. And if you compare with this, uh, this thing, uh, you, you will see that, uh, you will see the, the value which is hidden, uh, hidden behind this concrete value, which is uh, 06 something expressed through pi. Uh, so uh, for, this, uh, for this value, uh, the spectrum is infinite, even it's very close. Uh, even it's very close to the threshold. And if you want to see it, uh, here is the 14 eigenfunctions. You see that uh, you cannot distinguish by the naked eye this from an Archimedean to our Archimedean spiral. But still, uh, the the true Archimedean spiral had no no discrete spectrum. This one has an infinite. And this is a 14th eigenfunction. You can count the, the, the nodal lines. Here is the value at which this has happened. So 2 pi uh, square uh, force uh, root uh, 1 over. OK, so that's about what I wanted to say. Uh, the reference to the paper is here. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions in the room? I don't see questions so far. No, no question in the room? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, what happens if you, I mean, this is in two dimensions, but there are domains like uh, when you have snail uh, that they, they have a, a domain like that, which is in, in three dimension, right? Uh, Raphael, certainly they are. That's uh, that's our intention to look into that. It's more complicated, uh, more complicated, and there is the whole zoo. I mean, if you open the paper I gave you, uh, ga uh, and the reference I gave you, you have a list of open questions. This is one of them. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Why sorry? <laughs> uh, are there any other questions? So on site, no questions. So uh, I have just a very naive question. Um, did uh, in, in your analysis, did conformal invariance play a role? Uh, not, not really, uh, but it is uh, not really, but it is close to conformal invariance in the sense that the coordinates I used are, uh, are locally orthogonal. Yeah, but it's not, uh, it's not a conformal transformation. I see. I see there is a question online, Laszlo. Is, can this be done for Dirac as well? 
<laughs> Very nice question. I have no answer to that. <laughs> More questions? Okay, if that's not the case, let us uh, thank Pavel Exner again. Thank you very much. To the next speaker. Okay, perfect. Oh, great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, um, our, our next speaker is Angso Biazi from the Jagiellonian University, and uh, he will speak on deterministic turbulence in physical systems. Please. Uh, thank you for the introduction and let me thank the organizers of this meeting for giving me the opportunity to share my work. Um, I am going to talk about a collection of papers that we have published, not only me, I mean, this is in collaboration with Piotr Pisson, Ole Hefning and even more people. And the goal of this research is to study the resonant structure of physical systems. Uh, the motivation or the application that it has is that um, these kind of structures, they are common in many physical systems or they are behind uh, different phenomena. For example, in the case of the gross pitaevsky equation, this equation describes Bose-Einstein condensates or the propagation of light in optical fibers, for example. And we also find these kind of structures or they were used to study black hole formation in general relativity, for example, in the context of, of uh, the instability of space-time, the, sorry, the instability of ADS space-time, and, for example, also in nonlinear waves in compact domains. Some implications that I am going to show is that, okay, we can use these kind of resonant structures to study the long-time dynamics or the blow-up of some solutions, for example, the turbulent cascades in the sense that the energy spreads through the spectrum and it excites high modes and at the end of the day we have some kind of blow up the Sobolev norms blow up and also we have found some integrable destructors so it has some connections with integrability the ingredients that I am going to use or the systems that I am going to consider they have the, the, the following properties uh, we need a spatial confinement, like a bounded domain or, for example, some confining potential, like the harmonic potential. Uh, the resonant spectrum, uh, we need the resonant spectrum, the sp spectrum of linear modes or the frequencies, they satisfy a relation like this. Okay, more or less, but yeah, a resonant relation like this. And uh, we work in the limit of weak nonlinearities. So the coupling, in this case, this is G, uh, is very small. And the key point of these ingredients is that, in this case, the dynamics split in different time scales. At time scales of order one, we have the, I mean, the dynamics is governed by the linear evolution, so this is trivial. But at time scales of one over G, uh, the first nonlinear effects appear. In this case, these linear effects are fully related to resonant interactions, and the nonlinear effects related to non-resonant interactions appear at longer, larger time scales. So, the idea I am going to show the idea with the with the example of the two-dimensional Gross-Pitaevsky equation. Let me see here. We have the 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 equation with the harmonic potential, the typical uh, nonlinearity. 
And if we write the, the solution in terms of uh, the Fourier modes, or the, we decompose the solution in the basis of the linear modes of this equation, we have here the, co the Fourier coefficients. And the spectrum, we can see that this is linear in the, in the mode number, so it's uh, resonant. And the point is that, sorry, I don't know how to deal with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can rewrite the, this equation in terms of the evolution of the coefficients of the Fourier modes. And th this part is, is exact. We have an equation for these coefficients that is the resonant interactions plus the non-resonant interactions. However, as I said, at the time scale of 1 over g, where the first nonlinear effects appear, um, non-resonant interactions, we can neglect these terms, so we can uh, construct or the, what is known as the resonant approximation, that is uh, an equation of this form with, uh, we, here we only have the, the resonant interactions between modes. And this is also known, maybe it's more well known in the context of PDs, uh, like Birkhoff normal form or two-time formalism. It has many, many names. So, but the idea is that this kind of structure with these Cs, they are just numbers. Uh, I don't, I will not go into the details, but this is they are numbers that they codify the information of my original partial differential equation. So this structure is quite generic. And is, this is generic for different systems. So I will study it like this to try to go after that closer to, to these systems. Uh, the first part or the what we did at the beginning was we explored different physical systems. We constructed the resonant equation. So from the some, some physical models, we constructed the resonant equation. And for some of them, we found that this equation, these resonant uh, equations, they have an invariant manifold. And in particular, this invariant manifold is a uh, integrable so we can obtain solutions and we found this property in the context of the for example the two-dimensional gross pitefsk equation with the harmonic potential for some models of these or some restrictions of this equation and uh, this is uh, almost real not almost this is real life physics in the sense that uh, this equation describes uh, the propagation of light in optical fibers so this is an accurate description and also two-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensates or almost two-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensates can be obtained in the, laboratory, in the laboratory. And for example, here I have the, the pictures sorry, of, the, of the solutions that we obtain with this invariant manifold. Uh, they are these different distributions of vortices or dark rings that in connection with the previous talk, the vortices perform in spirals and out spirals. And in, also in the case, this invariant manifold or this special resonant structure, we found it in the context of some models of the scalar field in anti space spacetime, and also in nonlinear waves in compact domains, like some scalar field on the sphere, for example. After that, we found this uh, that different systems, they have this common property, this kind of, let's say, partial integrability or something like that. So we decided to go in the opposite direction. Instead of from the, from the physical system, from the PDE to the resonant equation, we decided to impose this condition, the invariant manifold, and we constructed all the, all the resonant equations that have this special property, this special uh, invariant manifold with integrable properties. And it allowed us to obtain, for example, extra conserved quantities, uh, okay, the integrable invariant manifold, because we imposed this condition at the beginning. Also, time periodic solutions, uh, infinite families of stationary solutions, so many, many solutions. And the nice property of this family is that it gathers uh, different systems, like, as I said, a two-dimensional gross pitefsk equation, anti city space times, nonlinear waves in compact domains. And for example, this is a, a nice observation is that here we have a cute relation between Bose-Einstein condensates or, or gross pitefsk equation and anti city space time. That I am not going to develop this comment here, but there we, we have found some, some relations. 
And okay, up to this point, this is what we did in the context of physics. But we found that there are solutions in physics that they, um, they blow up. For example, uh, motivated by the instability of the anti-decitary space-time, if we place a small amount of energy in this space-time and we wait long enough, we obtain a black hole. This is the conjecture. And I think that we will find a proof. We will have a proof soon. And the point is that we can use these kind of methods and we can observe that the, the energy spreads through the spectrum and excites high modes and at some point numerically we can see that uh, we have a blow up of the of the resonant approximation. So we try in order, but this is a numerically because the equation, these equations are, the structure of these, of these coefficients in, the, in this case is really, really, they are very complicated. So we try to, to construct toy models with uh, these nice properties. We want to understand blow up, so let's construct a toy model and let's understand what happens. Mm, the simplest model that we can think is the cubic cell equation. This is a super nice model because all the coefficients are one. Uh, it was introduced by Patrick Gerard and Grelier. And this is a nice model because it's integrable, fully integrable. Uh, it has two lax pairs instead of one, two. And it has many invariant manifolds and it has something that we, we are going to denominate almost blow up because I can fine tune the initial configurations to obtain Sobolev norms that grow uh, arbitrarily. I mean, I can make these Sobolev norms as large as I want. So what I did is we modified this cubic cell equation, but instead of a small modification, we perform a very abrupt modification in the sense that we remove a lot of interactions or a lot of couplings of this system. What we did is here, instead of all the coefficients, all the couplings are one, what we did is a all the coefficients that, uh, all the interactions that uh, don't involve the lowest mode, we remove them. So we remove all the interactions between uh, high modes, for example, all the interactions, yeah, between intermediate modes, only the interactions that involve the, the lowest mode remain. And in principle, you can see, yeah, okay, probably you will not obtain, you will obtain nothing, but uh, in fact, this, this truncation is quite nice because we preserve integrability, we lose one lax pair, but we preserve one. And typically when you modify an, an equation that is integrable, you don't expect that you preserve integrability. Uh, we also preserve the invariant manifolds. And some nice property is that you can see very well because I have this green box here. But the point is that in the case of the original system, we have almost blow up, but with this deformation, we have infinite time blow up. There's our Sobolev, we can obtain exact solutions where our Sobolev norms grow exponentially or uh, polynomially. And this is a nice property because usually people think that uh, to obtain this kind of blow up, we need that the interactions between heavy modes, they should be quite uh, strong or this the coefficients, the coupling should be large. And in this case, we removed all of them. Of course, we have the interaction between high modes plus we, that involve uh, the lowest mode. But yeah, this truncation is quite cute because we remove almost the, all the interactions and we have these, these properties. But we have finite time blow up. So we try to, to go uh, I mean, to obtain uh, something better, we try to obtain finite time blow up, uh, introducing a different modification. In this case, we introduce uh, this deformation of the uh, cubic cell equation with this term. If this uh, g is equal to zero, we have the cubic cell equation. And we found that if g is greater than zero, we have finite time blow up. However, this is a numerical observation and we don't have the analytic proof yet. And yeah, I don't know very well how to do it. The point is that we wanted to introduce a deformation that the, the structure is quite simple. Just 
something like this. We don't have a, any coefficient here. We have just this extra factor here. Um, but for the moment, I have some results, but I don't know how to prove it, um, uh, the finite time blow up uh, rigorously. So if you have any idea, please contact me. OK. So the conclusions. Uh, resonant interactions accurately describe the long time dynamics in the limit of weak nonlinearities. These techniques have a wide range of applicability in physics from Bose Einstein condenses to general relativity, for example, the black hole formation in the, in the context of the instability of uh, ADS space time. And this is an important remark. Uh, in some cases, the, these resonant structures uncover hidden structures of the equations in the sense that. Maybe my equation doesn't have a exact structure, exact integrability, for example, let's say, or let's imagine something like that. But when I remove the non-resonant interactions, maybe my system, my what I obtain is that the structure is exact in this case. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Angso. So, uh, are there any questions? Yes, we have one question here. Um, can you hear me? No? I can hear you, but I think that it's not working. Yeah. Can you hear me now? In the same, but I can hear you. <laughs> So maybe you just repeat the question. Are you using other energies than just integral the, the integers? I mean, you posed in the beginning uh, the resonance condition in energies En, but then I think you use always En being equal to an integer, right? En equal to N, or I am use, I mistaken? I use always uh, in this work that En uh, equal to a linear, that. EN is linear in the mode number. Yeah, this is maximal resonance. Yeah, so to that's say. the point. Do, do you use other uh, no choices yet. of EN? No. No okay. yet. Thanks. It would be nice, but not yet. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, we have one more question. OK, let's see. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to know, so you have this uh, data that uh, leads to uh, infinite time blow up, and I'd like to know if you have to fine tune the data or you find that many data blow up, or maybe uh, all. Okay. Um, we don't, I mean, we have like a space of, uh, we, the invariant, this system has a three dimensional invariant manifold. So we have to fine tune the initial data in the sense that we have to go to a, to reduce, I mean, the initial data that blows up, if I remember properly, is in a two dimensional a manifold of this three dimensional space. But there we have a wide region of exponent that where the, um, of exact solutions where the, the, um, the sobol of norms grow exponentially and even we, ha we can move along this uh, two-dimensional surface, let's say, and in, we can transit from, uh, from exponential growth to, uh, to bounded Sobolev norms, and even in the transition we can find a, a polynomial growth of Sobolev norms, so mm, it's not so fine-tuned. Yeah, in the sense, in Sego is, uh, we have to fine-tune, but in this case, no. Maybe I'll ask a question if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask, after blow up, so you have this example of cubic sego, which you modify with this n plus one to the g. After blow up, do you expect to lose determinism in, in the sense that uh, if you add a regularization and you remove it, do you expect that the, as you remove it, you converge on a Dirac mass on the Cauchy solution, or do you expect to converge to a distribution? Okay, uh, I don't know how to answer. There's this I, notion I, of spontaneous stochasticity in such models, which have a singularity embedded in them. 
Mm, no, I, I don't know how to answer. I mean, what I did is my goal was to prove or obtain the singularity. So we are now in this direction. Uh, once we can prove or we have a, I mean, a better analytic uh, treatment of this problem, we could think about af what happens after the singularity. But for the moment, no, uh, we did. Thank you. Okay, then uh, no more questions. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. And uh, yes, to move on to the next speaker. Right, so I guess it's my turn to introduce the next speaker. Great. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Fabio Pizzichiglio uh, from uh, CNRS and uh, Dauphine. And he will talk about boundary value problems for the 2D Dirac operator on corner domains. So first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here today, both online and on site. And uh, also I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present this joint work with uh, Han van den Bosch from University of Santiago de Chile about this uh, Dirac operator on corner domains. So we are in the session of partial differential equations. Let me start with the first equation of the talk, that is the Dirac equation. So it is formalized uh, in this way, E D T U equal D0 of U, where D0 is the free Dirac operator that uh, in dimension two is defined in this way, uh, where M is a positive constant, and sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three are the poly matrices. So why this equation is important? Well, it was theorized by the British physicist Paul Dirac to describe the evolution of one half spin particle, such electrons, currently with both theory of quantum mechanics and special relativity. Moreover, more recently, it has been proved that this model is effective for graphene. So let me give you some properties about this guy. The first thing that we notice is evident is that the, the Dirac operator is, is not a scalar operator, it is a matrix operator. So this will add some technical difficulties. In particular, remember that all the functions that uh, we will consider in this talk will be C2 valued function. Of course, I will omit to make the presentation uh, clear. Second property. If we compute the, the square of the free Dirac operator, we recover the uh, klein gordon operator. So this means that using this approach, we can recover, uh, we can compute the square root of klein gordon operator without passing through the theory of pseudo-differential operators. Third property about self-adjointness. The free Dirac operator is self-adjoint on the Sobolev space H1. And finally, the spectrum. The spectrum is purely essential and uh, and uh, it is given by this set. So as you can see, there's a positive part and a negative part. So this means that the, the Dirac operator is not bounded below. And so, a priori, any variational approach has to be discarded. So since I'm interested in um, boundary value problems, let me fix just some notation. Of course, I will identify C with R2. Then omega plus uh, is a bounded, open, and connected set. Omega minus is the interior part of its complementary. Then capital sigma is the, the surface, the, the, the boundary. Uh, this more sigma is the Hausdorff measure, actually is the surface measure. 
and then finally n and t are the normal unit vector and uh, the tangent one. Okay, so let me introduce the boundary value problem that I'm interested in. The first one is related to the study of graphene and it is called quantum dot. So imagine that you have an infinite sheet of graphene and then that you want to cut it and to obtain a bounded domain. So depending on the way you cut, you, are, you will obtain different boundary uh, condition. So here you have two examples. Uh, the first one is this way, it's called zigzag and is parameterized by B equal to zero. And the second one is the armchair and is parameterized by B equal to one. So in this work, we consider, we excluded the zigzag boundary value problem, so we just consider B strictly positive. The second model that I, we analyzed, this actually is not really a boundary condition, but it can be interpreted in, in this way. So the idea is that we want to perturb the free Dirac operator with a, a, a distribution that is supported on, on a hypersurface, or in this case, on a curve. And so the, uh, we cannot use, in this case, a variational approach, so we have to do it by hand. So the idea is quite simple. We consider M, M any Hermitian matrix, and so uh, we consider U uh, with this form. So U has two traces, one approaching sigma from the interior part, and then one approaching sigma from the exterior part. And so we can, define, we can define this distribution. So in particular, if we compute now the action of this operator on such a U, we have that this action is divided into parts, a regular part and a singular part. So since we want, uh, so of course here, here we are, no, okay, sorry. Here we, we are using a formula, uh, the derivative, the formula of, of the derivative in the sense of distributions of function that uh, have uh, a jump. So we want this operator well defined in L2, and uh, so we have to ask that the singular part cancel. So we recover a boundary condition that is actually a transmission condition on the surface sigma between functions that are defined in the interior part and functions that are defined in the exterior, on the exterior part. So in particular in this work, we consider a particular class of boundary condition. We consider this Lorentz scalar delta shell interaction. That is, we consider M, M matrix M of this form, tau sigma three, uh, with tau uh, a real number. Okay, so I'm interested to the problem of self-adjointness, and in particular, uh, in terms of Sobolev regularity. Uh, of course, these two operators are different, but uh, the strategy that we can use is similar for both cases. Of course, computation will be different. So without uh, loss of generality, let me denote D uh, by D both operator, okay? There will be some difference and then I will specify it. So the first result of this talk is this theorem. Um, when, so let us consider sigma as a C2 regular curve. And so we can define uh, the, uh, free, this operator D on the set of H1 functions such that these boundary conditions are verified. And then it's easy to see that the operator D is symmetric on this domain, it's just integration by parts, but then one has to prove self-adjointness. And then to have this kind of result, one has to apply techniques of singular integral uh, operators and also some technique of elliptic regularity. So actually there are several works on this topic. I'm just citing these two because uh, actually, they are the one that I've studied most. So the first one is by Ben-Guri et al. about quantum dot boundary condition. And the second one is by Tomar Mie Bonafos and Luis Vega about the delta shell interaction. Uh, so when, when I met Anne, we were discussing about this, these works. And then we realized actually that uh, some tools used in these papers can be used, are valid, uh, when the, the surface is less regular. For instance, when it is Lipschitz. So we, we said, okay, let us see what's happening. Let us try to analyze our Lipschitz surface. And then it turns out that this is quite a difficult problem, so we are still working on it. But then we said, okay, let us consider something simpler. Let us consider a curvilinear polygon. So what is a curvilinear polygon? It's just a C2 piecewise curve, so it has a finite number of corners. Uh, actually, in this talk, I will, I will just assume that the corner is one and it coincides uh, with the origin. 
but please, I mean, keep in mind that this approach can be used for a finite number of corners. So then once again, we said, okay, let us do uh, as in the C2 cases, in C2 case. Let us define the operator D on H1 such that uh, the, um, on the set of H1 functions that verifies boundary condition. So once again, the operator is symmetric on this, in, on this domain. But then we realized that the, the corner was adding, uh, was removing regularity. So we said, okay, let us try to, to localize this operator. So the idea is to localize close to the corner. So the study, to study this operator close to the corner and far from the corner. So when we are far, we can use the, the C2 regular theory. So, and what's happening close to the corner? Well, we could prove the following theory. So we proved that for a row small enough, it is just a radius, then the operator D, the, the, the domain of the adjoint operator, so the domain of D star, can be written as the sum of the domain of D plus this space n row. So what is n row? n row is the set of, this of the functions that are localized close to the corner that verifies this equation. Laplacian of V equal to zero with uh, this very strange boundary condition. Oh, and then we took the modulus on H1 because we already know that functions in H1 are included in the domain of D. So now, if you want to solve this problem, you have to solve this equation. Laplacian of V equal to zero, but then with very strange boundary conditions. So we tried, but uh, we were not able to see nothing familiar in this boundary condition. And so we said, okay, let us consider uh, an easier case. So we said, okay, let us consider the, the, the wedge, the straight corner. So in this case, the computation are easier because we have polar coordinates. And so thanks to this, we could characterize the space and row. In particular, we proved that in the quantum, for the quantum dot case, when the angle is con convex, then uh, the n row is equal to zero. And in, when the angle is not convex, then n row is the space generated by these two functions, u0 and u minus uh, one, that are, complete, that are uh, explicit computed, and they have this kind of decay when r goes to zero. So in particular, thanks to this result and the previous one, we proved the following. For the quantum dot model, when the angle is convex, then the operator is self-adjoint. So we have H1 regularity. When the angle is not convex, is not convex, then the operator D has infinite self-adjoint extensions that can be parameterized in this way. And uh, so we lose H1 regularity. Actually, we lose Sobolev regularity. But as you can see, for one extension and just for one extension, we recover H1 half regularity. So at least we, we, we lost just a bit of Sobolev regularity. And uh, so since this extension is in some sense special, I will call it distinguished. Uh, for the Lorentz scalar delta shell interaction, we had a similar result. Uh, actually, we had this kind of result. U0 and U minus one will be different, of course. And, uh, but we do not have any distinction between a convex angle and concave angle, of course. It's a transmission condition, so it will be convex from one side and then not convex from the other side. So let us finally go back to the curvilinear polygon. So we, could, we wanted to use this result to analyze the case of a curvilinear polygon. And so we, the idea was to use a certain map F that could uh, map this guy into this guy. And so in particular, with this strategy, we could prove the following theorem. So when omega is, uh, so when the angle is convex, then the operator is self-adjoint on H1. Otherwise, it admits a unique self-adjoint extension whose domain is included in H1 half, and of course, a similar result for the Lorentz scalar delta shell interaction. So this result is weaker than the one proved before, because before we could prove, we could characterize all self-adjoint extension, and here I'm just able to prove the existence of a, of a unique self-adjoint extension. Okay, we agree, it's the good one, but still we do not, we cannot prove the existence of the infinite self-adjoint extensions. So what is the problem? Actually, we believe that for the quantum dot uh, model, this kind of is just a technical difficulty. 
because F can be a conformal map. And so we believe that we, will, we, we are able to prove the existence of infinite self-adjoint extension. But what's happened well, for the Lorentz scalar delta shell, we cannot use conformal map. F cannot be a conformal map. There, it does not exist any conformal map that could map the interior part in the interior part and then the exterior part on the exterior part. And so F has to be a change of variables. This will produce some pieces to estimate. And uh, to estimate these pieces, uh, we had to assume a priori H1 half regularity. So, so this is the point. And uh, uh, so as you can see, this just, it's open. There are a lot of open problems. And we are working on it. So hopefully in three years, we will be here discussing the next chapter of this movie. So I will stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Fabio. Are there any questions? Yes, we have a question. Do you hear me? So, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Does it work? I, I, I mean, I think that uh, we have some problem here because. Okay, so I can do it like without the mic. Yeah, I mean, as you want. No, you, I, I don't think that you are. <clears throat> can you turn off the mic? Turn, turn on the microphone? I can hear you, um, so. If there is a question in the room, please just go ahead. OK. OK, OK. Yeah. Yes. So uh, will the results survive if you combine the Lorex scalar with the electrostatic interaction? Excuse me? Uh, will the uh, will your results survive if you combine uh, Lorentz scalar you use with electrostatic interaction? No, no, not using this approach. So the Lorentz scalar is uh, is good because it's uh, it's a nice potential when you compute the square, but the electrostatic interaction has not this property. So at the end you will have a, another part that is going to be messy, and so you cannot have this kind of result. So about this, uh, so this kind of result. So in row will be something worse. Does it work now? Yeah, okay. So uh, this is perhaps a stupid question, but when you consider your corner, you avoided all the time the case when the angle is equal to pi. What's going on? Yeah, so when oh, the no, no, sorry, oh, yeah, it's pi, not pi over 2. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. It's, so, yeah, so it was stupid. Okay. <laughs> Are other questions in the room? Uh, yes, there is one. So uh, you mentioned the zigzag boundary condition, but you said that you didn't, well, consider the case. Is there a chance to, to have a feeling why it's more difficult or the criticality? Uh, or? Okay, so yes, yes, the, this kind of approach is not working. And uh, so actually we discussed with uh, Edgardo Stockmeyer too. And we, I mean, also in the, in the C2 case, the, the zigzag condition, I mean, is not, is not treated in, the, in this kind of work that I cited here. So they, they made it in another work. So we believe that probably the same strategy can work for this case. But I mean, we, we haven't checked yet. All right, thank you for all the questions. Uh, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Uh, I think we're ready, right? Yes, we're ready here. Okay. Uh, 
Um, we're very happy to have our next speaker, Hava Yoldash from uh, uh, Claude Bernard in Lyon. And uh, she will uh, tell us about hypercoercivity of linear kinetic uh, equations via Harris's theorem. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thanks all for uh, all the participants on, si on site and online for staying here and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Today I, I'm going to talk about uh, present a um, probabilistic method to study the long time behavior of some uh, linear kinetic equations. It's a joint work with uh, later their name will appear, but uh, Jose Caniso from Granada, uh, Chuki Kao from uh, China, and uh, Josephine Evans from Warwick. Um, and let's see. So uh, the equations that we are interested in are of this form. They are that they are describing the time evolution of uh, distribution of particles, can be gas particles or dust particles, some depending on the application. And I uh, separated the transport part and the collision part. And the transport operation, uh, operator uh, describing the, either the uh, free transport with uh, constant speed when the equations are posed on the d-dimensional torus with periodic boundary conditions or it is, it's the transport again under the effect of uh, some external potential and some uh, confining, po confining potential when the equations are posed in RD. And the, on the right hand side, we, we have the collision term, which uh, to, we are, today we are going to talk about only two uh, equations. One of them is the um, l linear relaxation Boltzmann equation, also known as the linear BGK equation. And the second one is the linear Boltzmann equation. So for the case with, uh, oops, okay. for the case with the linear BGK equation, uh, we write the collision term, uh, collision um, operator of this form, where uh, where the m is will be the Maxwellian velocity distribution. And uh, for the case with the uh, linear Boltzmann equation, this um, uh, the collision term is written of this form. So um, linear BGK equation is uh, one of the simplest uh, kinetic equation is known to be hypercoercive. It's a toy model actually to introduce to study the uh, uh, non-linear Boltzmann equation, which has some similar sim properties. And the linear Boltzmann equation here we are interested in is describing the um, interaction of particles with the background medium already in equilibrium. So here I will come to the details more, but uh, one thing is the collision term, a collision operator only acts on the, acts on the velocity variable and um, this gives the dissipation effect on the velocity and the transport operator have, uh, takes place only in the space. And then uh, the, the main problem is to estimate the effect of uh, this mixing effect of dissipation into the space variable and the, these methods of like studying these kind of problems for linear kinetic equations are has some history and they are called hypercoercivity and it is due to I wrote some important um, works here like there are many more of course it is going dating back to 2004 by papers uh, of uh, Ronier and Villani's uh, famous memoir. And then one important result in this direction was by, given by uh, Develet and Villani. They showed that nonlinear Boltzmann equation converges to equilibrium at least at an algebraic rate. And uh, there are some other, there is some other important, there are some other important results. One of them is in uh, L2 or H1 setting by Dolbo, Moa and Schmeiser. And what we are going to present here today will be in weighted L1 setting. So I also wrote one, one paper in this direction. And uh, these two equations we will be interested in are also studied by many people before. And there are some important results. Of course, there are many more. So, yeah. So uh, let's look at the like precise assumptions we, we, we make for the linear Boltzmann equation. First of all, uh, this is a kind of uh, standard assumption where the collision kernel can be written of this form. 
I mean, uh, of course, there, there, there are some other assumptions too, but the, this is what we assume here in this work, where what, what is important here is, here is the uh, exponent gamma. We, uh, we consider the cases where it's uh, greater than or equal to zero. So when gamma is equal to zero corresponds to Maxwell molecules case. And when it is bigger than zero and less than or equal to one, it is the uh, hard potentials which will be included. And we also assume that B here is integrable in sigma and uniformly positive. So as an example, we can include in our work that when B is equal to one and gamma is equal to one, which corresponds to the hard spheres collision kernels, but uh, we don't consider the non cutoff kernels, who, which are uh, the cases where B is not integrable here. Mm. Okay, so here I uh, present the statements of the theorems, uh, which look a bit complicated maybe, but I will just uh, mention them in a, in a mm, simpler way. So uh, we consider the linear uh, BGK or uh, the linear Boltzmann equation with any initial data, which is a probability distribution. And this theorem uh, is valid for the case when the space variable is in the d-dimensional torus or periodic boundary conditions with the periodic boundary conditions. In this case, uh, we show that, that there is a unique equilibrium and in this, uh, uh, in this um, uh, probability distribution, which is a unique equilibrium. And the uh, solutions to these equations converge to this equilibrium um, exponentially. So the unique equilibrium shape of the equilibrium is very well known in this, this case and studied also, it's the, given by the Maxwellian velocity distribution. And the convergence in the BGK case is uh, given, by, given in the total variation distance and in the linear Boltzmann case, is it, it is the weighted total variation distance the, with the weight uh, is a function of velocity. So next, uh, the theorem is when the equations are posed in the in the um, RD whole space. So in this case, we need to consider the con confining potential uh, because we need some kind of confinement uh, property to get some high coercivity result. So is, these are the precise assumptions on the confining potential. The first one is on the linear BGK case, and the second one is in, on the linear Boltzmann case. So uh, what, to sum up, what does it say is the confining potential should be growing at least quadratically at infinity. If we have this uh, type of uh, confining potential precisely satisfying these conditions, then we can show that there exists a unique equilibrium and the convergence, uh, the solutions converge to that unique equilibrium in a weighted total variation distance, which is the weight is given here by uh, as, as a function of x, the space, velocity, and the, and the confining potential. So the last uh, part is when the um, confining potential, uh, for, it's for the weaker confining potentials. So um, when the confining potentials are uh, like uh, gro growing less than quadratically at infinity or uh, sub-quadratic potentials, then, then we will have uh, obviously the um, we will have the um, weak, um, slower convergence rate to equilibrium in these cases. So this is the uh, case for the linear BGK equation, and the and this similar uh, for the linear Boltzmann equation. So yeah, so the uh, where the when we have the confining potential, when the equations are posed in the RD, and when we have the confining potential which grows, uh, which is subquadratic, then we will have an algebraic convergence rate to equilibrium, in equilibriums in these cases. So I will just explain a little bit about the tool we are using. I'm not going, go, going to go into the details of the proofs. So it's based on Harris's theorem, which, which dates back to Dublin's paper in 1945, which is uh, uh, about, the studying, about studying the uh, invariant measures for discrete Markov chains. Then Harris, in 96 paper, um, studied the necessary and sufficient, uh, sufficient um, prop, um, 
um, yes, necessary and sufficient conditions to, for a Markov chain to possess an invariant measure. And then Main and Tweed in 93, they use these results to show convergence to that unique equilibrium, unique um, invariant measure. And in uh, this 2011 paper by, by Harer and Mattingly, they uh, presented a simpler or uh, a version of proof of these theorems uh, by using transport mass distances. So are also results based on this, uh, the, this version of the um, theorem, the proof, let's say. So in based, I mean, the, according to these, these papers, when you, you need to satisfy several conditions to get to the, um, to have a unique equilibrium for your Markov process and convergence to that process, the, these uh, hypotheses, when they are satisfied um, quantitatively, you, you may, you will get a quantitative convergence rate to, uh, for depending the, um, the constants depending on the, and the rates depending on the constants which are coming from the hypothesis. Here, uh, the, in the first case, you will need to have some good confining property given by the foster Lyapunov condition, finding some suitable Lyapunov um, function, which is the, the as star will be, is the uh, adjoint operator for our uh, kinetic equation. And then uniform mixing property, uh, which, uh, which corresponds to the case that uh, bound, uh, finding a bound for, of probability of transitioning for a Markov process from any initial state to, to a subset of the state space. And then with the foster Lyapunov condition, you show that the process will end up in that uh, subset of the state space infinitely of many often times. Then if you satisfy, verify these conditions, then the theorem gives a existence of an uniqueness of, of an exist, uh, existence and uniqueness of an equilibrium and convergence to that equilibrium. In the case of the subgeometric convergence, then uh, the uh, Lyapunov uh, condition should, should be uh, of a different form. Uh, it should satisfy more um, um, properties where I just wrote these things maybe want to be able to mention, but this psi should be, uh, phi should be a concave function here. So um, this is just a introduction of maybe the methodology. So this works only for uh, linear equations because the, uh, this can be applied to only Markov semigroups. They should be linear. Uh, they are linear and uh, they preserve mass and positivity and linear BGK and linear Boltzmann equations are known that they, they already satisfy these conditions. And as a final remark by, by using the Harris's theorem, we obtain exponential convergence to equilibrium in the case where these two equations posed in the d-dimensional torus or in RD when the uh, confining potentials are uh, growing uh, quadratically at infinity. And uh, for, the, uh, for the weaker confining potentials, we give algebraic convergence rates and the methods are constructive. The, it is, uh, by Harris's theorem, and then our results are in weighted total variation or weighted L1 distances, which also has some kind of advantages where we can include uh, some wider range of initial data, like uh, a bit uh, less having some initial data with less regularity, let's say, and uh, existence of solutions are given under quite general conditions. In these two cases, actually, it's known, well studied, but for some other applications of some other linear, linear kinetic equations where the uh, equilib shape of the equilibrium is not known, uh, these type of uh, methods, using these type of methods are um, giving uh, some, I mean, giving nice results without requiring to know the shape of the equilibrium. So that will be all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Um, are there any questions in the room first, maybe? Yes, there is one. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so I have a question concerning the, um, the knowledge uh, of the Cauchy problem concerning the linear Boltzmann equation in the L1 setting. So for example, with the result of convergence that you have, can you improve, uh, I mean, can you deduce that since there exist perhaps some solutions linearly 
I mean, for small um, for small time interval, given the convergence to equilibrium, can you improve the results of existence or something like this? Mm, uh, well, I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't think it will uh, help in having some, uh, yeah, proving. Um, I I don't think so. I don't know, but yeah. So <laughs> sorry. Okay. Thank you. We have one more question. So in the case of subquadratic potentials, is it known whether the convergence is really just algebraic or it's conjectured that it's exponential or is there anything known? What should be the real convergence? So it should be subgeometric. Uh, yeah, I mean, it should be, you mean it's, if, sh if it should be algebraic or, I mean, mm. it should be not exponential, okay. slower than exponential. There are, mer there are some works on it. But this one is the up to my knowledge. It's the only work where you can provide some quantitative rates of convergence, which were also in the statements of the theorem. So it should be sub uh, exponential. I don't see more questions here. So I, I want to ask uh, two, two questions. One is regarding your method. When you when you restrict to potentials in which the I think the power in the collision kernel was gamma was uh, non-negative, mm -hmm. so which one of the assumptions of Harris's theorem does not allow you to go to negative powers of gamma, so towards Landau or something like that? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. I think I. So um, we need to somehow uh, find the bound uh, for the collision term acting on some some measure we need to find a bound at each uh, step like we iterate like we, by do mass formula and, and it's based on finding some positive bound for for this part as well so uh, when the okay gamma is less than one i mean for yeah, non I mean less than zero less than zero sorry yeah when when this part is not integrable so it is. Uh, yeah, but also for the heat equation, you see, if yeah. you were studying the heat equation, you would not put the Laplacian on the other side of the equation and try to bound it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I think there should be some kind of way to modify your approach yeah, to also be able to include gamma less than zero. Yeah, but, but, um, yeah in this case, I don't exactly remember why, why we couldn't do that, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I need to think about this. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and the, the second question has to do with, um, I guess, quantitative estimates. So if you put an epsilon in front of the collision term, mm -hmm. do you know how uh, the spectral gap or the, 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 the lambda at the exponential, how it's going to depend on the epsilon? Mm -mm. No, no, I'm sorry, no. But is it... But is it uh, is it that the Harris approach, because uh, you mentioned at some point that if you know the parameters in the three assumptions, yes, then one can deduce the spectral gap. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if one can go through this computation or not. Yeah, so, okay, you mean just uh, putting some positive epsilon in front of collision? Yeah, like it's a weakly collisional regime, let's say, yeah. and if it's a weak collisional regime, you expect that the uh, spectral gap decreases, of course, with yeah. uh, So, yeah, as long as I think we still, if we can verify this hypothesis really, like by bounding at each iteration acting with the collision kernel and finding a uh, lower bound for that and also applying the transport and bounding that again and acting collision operator, bound, finding a bound and integrating that part again. I think it should work, but I, I, I need to think about it too, I guess. I, mean, I, okay. I don't know. Okay, thank you. thank you. Are there any further questions? Not from here. Okay, in that case, let's thank the speaker again.
I think you're ready, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. For, no, uh, wait, 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 yeah, wait, 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 to uh, introduce you. <laughs> let me try to introduce you, Raphael. So, <laughs> our uh, last speaker of the contributed talk session is Raphael Winter for ANS Lyon, and he will tell us about the rigorous validity of the cho ullenberg equation. Thank yeah, you thank right. you very much for the introduction, especially since I cut you off and you still introduced me. Um, and also for you bearing with me until uh, this very late hour. So today I want to... Uh, Ah, sorry. Uh, so today I want to present a result uh, which is in joint work with Sergio Simonella, who's a CNS researcher at uh, UNS Lyon. And it's the organizers did a good job of placing the two talks one after another because it will be on the Boltzmann equation or more precisely on the derivation of the Boltzmann equation from particle systems. And um, I cannot go through the classical theory in detail, but um, so what we will be concerned with is the derivation of this equation from particle systems. And this was pioneered by Lanford in 1975, where he connected the PDE with the scaling limit of interacting particles. And this is done in the low density limit. So uh, you can think of it, we have particles with a radius epsilon, which is sent to zero, and the number of particles increases, and you put them randomly at, at the initial uh, time. Then in the, in, in, in the scaling limit, epsilon going to zero, and, and the number of particles being epsilon to the minus two in two, three dimensions, then the particle density uh, will converge to a solution of the, of the Boltzmann equation. So this F epsilon will always be the density of the particle system in this, uh, depending on the scaling parameter epsilon. So, and there have been a number of works which I cannot review after by many colleagues working on this equation, including Laure Saint-Ramon, Isabel Galaghia, Thierry Bodino, Benjamin Tertier, Mario Pulvirenti, Chiara Safirio, and Sergio Simonella, but also many more which I cannot uh, mention. And uh, with Sergio, we were looking at uh, some physics literature where they had as a big open problem to, they, they say, okay, this is valid if the volume fraction of particles is zero, essentially. But they were interested in what happens if the volume fraction is very small but positive. And there was this program in physics followed by Uhlenbeck, Cohen, Murphy, Rezibois, and many others to essentially try to expand this theory in powers of the scaling parameter epsilon. And there are various approaches in their different settings. They were a bit confusing to us, especially since the, at some point also this sort of failed and the, in the 70s this was, uh, this was stopped in the, in the physics literature. And um, so we wanted to try to find a mathematically rigorous formalism for this. So we started with, okay, the first result we have is the, is the classical result that this F epsilon particle density converges to a solution of the uh, Boltzmann equation. And um, our goal was to find, okay, we, we can say mathematically rigorous, the, the, the linear correction to that would be if we could find a PDE and a solution to these PDEs, let's call them F epsilon bar, such that if I compare the particle density to the solution of the PDE, I'm approximating the particle density better than an order epsilon. So the order, the error is of order small O of epsilon. And I'm comparing now the, the particle, the true particle density to, to a PDE again. And of course the challenge now in order to do something like that is to both find these operators and these, this PDE and then to prove the result. And in order to do so, when we, we went back sort of to Boltzmann's initial postulates for the Boltzmann equation. So how he found the equation was to postulate, okay, collisions between particles in a gas are purely binary. They will never happen that we have three particles colliding at the same time. And we will always call, talk about hard spheres here. So in that case, that will mostly not be a problem. Collisions are localized in space and time, also for Okay, that's, he postulated this for hard spheres also. And the most important condition is that when two particles are about to collide before they're sort of independent, so they haven't seen each other before. And okay, for positive epsilon, these postulates will not be exactly correct. So if you want to find the linear correction to the equation, we have to uh, be able to take into account the corrections to these postulates when epsilon is positive. And so this is what we did with Sergio. So the, 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 this is the results. So we found these operators uh, Q explicitly, they will be tertiary operators, and uh, they have this approximation uh, property. So if we solve that PDE, which later we found out is one of the ones that were actually suggested in the physics literature and is known as the cho ullenbeck equation. So if we solve that equation, then we approximate the particle density in epsilon better than an order epsilon. And for the experts, the, the, the operator is a combination of a, of a classical boltzmann enskog operator and then epsilon times an operator which is actually tertiary, so it involves three particles where we take into account these, these, uh, these corrections. And I will not be able to explain all this uh, notation here on the bottom of the slide, but I can sort of show you in pictures what it means. 
So uh, we can think of it again in terms of Boltzmann's postulates. So the first one that collisions are assumed to be purely binary is again true if you think of uh, hard spheres interacting, it will still never happen that they exactly happen, uh, the, you have exactly three particles or more colliding at the same time. Um, but we may have to take into account subsequent binary collisions. Uh, second postulate that collisions are localized in space and time is still true, again, because of hard sphere collision, but there's a slight error coming from the fact that when the, the momentum that is transferred between two hard spheres colliding is essentially transferred from one center of one particle to the center of the other particle. So it sort of jumps a distance epsilon. And that is mostly taken into account by this first operator, this boltzmann esco operator. And then there's the third and most important correction we need to do is that particles are no longer independent prior to collision. And that is mostly related to particles, what we call recolliding. So particles collide and then after some time they collide again. So, and in order to, 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 to see what's going on, what we did first is we, we distinguished direct and indirect recollisions. And indirect you see on the left, so there's this, red and the yellow particle, they collide. And we call a collision indirect if they collide again, but in between, they collectively collide with at least two other particles. Might be many, many more, but at least two others. So you, so you see they collide, and then there is the collision with the blue particle, with the green particle, and only then they collide again. And then there's a second case, which is uh, the case of direct recollisions. So you have the your yellow and red particle again colliding, and then this blue particle forces an immediate recollision of the two particles. And those are, we, we found, give the, give the leading order contribution, the one we have to take into account. And bear in mind that this picture is a bit simplistic because you can imagine that if we tune the collision a little bit more, then this yellow particle again could collide with the blue particle and so on and so forth. But if you want to think of what happens in this operator, normally you have this velocity v here and v1, and we, you, you pass to v1 prime and v prime in the normal Boltzmann operator. And instead now you have sort of three velocities and two impact parameters going in, v1, v, v1, v2, and you have to compute all the outgoing velocities uh, of these three particles after the full scattering pro process of these, only these three particles. And then there's actually a very cute observation that when you, uh, we got first stuck a bit, but then we found actually that when you, when you have three billiard balls in three-dimensional space, they can collide at most four times, no matter what the initial conditions are. So in this picture, yes, the yellow could again collide with the blue, but then this would necessarily have to stop. So sort of proving this also in terms of these, uh, what's called uh, pseudo trajectories was, is one of the ingredients to the proof. So this, uh, this scattering between three particles is sort of intrinsically fine, uniformly finite. Okay, and these are the main ingredients. So uh, in the proof, what you have to take into account. So you have to first prove that these indirect recollisions where they collide two or more times in between are, don't give a, a, a contribution to the order epsilon. And then you have to find a, an, a PDE, an operator that takes into account these direct recollisions of these particles. So essentially we have to take into account a memory of time epsilon and there's a third part which is sort of, if you imagine at the time zero, they're placed randomly in space, but they have radius epsilon positive. So you have sort of an error coming from the fact that they're not able to overlap. And that uh, error we also show is negligible and they we use some sort of classical cluster expansion techniques which are discussed here at this conference by much more difficult uh, settings by other people. Mm, so we're using sort of a simple version of cluster expansions there. And then we have to sh use that, melt all these ingredients together using this uh, iterated Duhamel expansion, which was uh, pioneered by Lanford, but this is sort of a, just a variant of this, of this argument. And then just to, as a concluding remark or a word of caution is that in, for example, in dimension two, the same would not be true. So in, in, in dimension two, the first order correction is actually not of order epsilon, but it's, of, it's a bigger by a logarithm. So, and it's actually not that difficult to see, but I sadly don't, don't have time to, to explain that now. But uh, and if, if one has to, wants to do this program for dimension two, then uh, one has to capture this logarithmic uh, term. In dimension three or higher, one can actually do it just the way Sergio and I did it. And I think that is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Are there questions in the room?
Yes, there is one. Yes. So uh, I have a question concerning, uh, let's say, the general process of Lanford. So if I'm correct, back to the, let's say, original proof, yeah. what Lanford does is to take a solution of the Boltzmann equation, to tensorize it, and to show that um, somehow you can approximate it by the first density, I mean, the, yeah, the first marginal of the density of the n hard spheres distribution function, right? Sort of. Uh, and so the starting point is to have a solution of the Boltzmann equation. So what's going on here? Are you able to exhibit easily a solution of your, let's say, modified Boltzmann equation? Yes, yeah, so I mean, the, there is a restriction of the Lanford result that you can actually not start with the tensorized Boltzmann equation. Otherwise, you would also have an infinite time interval on which you can do this derivation. So instead, what they do is they don't start with the tensorized Boltzmann equation, but they, they sort of take the Boltzmann equation and they, they, do an, they write down a series expansion for it. Actually, for the, first for the Liouville equation of the particle system. And that problem, the problem is that that is already just convergent on a small time interval, this, this, uh, this ser power series expansion, sort of in the number of collisions you do an expansion. For the for the origin for the full particle system, and that is only convergent for short times. So you anyway restricted to short times. So everything I'm saying is is restricted to the Lanford time, which has not been beaten since 1975. So there is a time at which only I think one quarter of the particles have actually just suffered a collision, and I cannot beat that. I'm working within this framework that was set by by all the other colleagues working on the on the equation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> other questions? I don't see other questions on site. Well, I, I want to ask you, maybe it's actually related to the previous question. In, for Boltzmann, you have the stationary states, which are Maxwellians. Mm -hmm. When you add the epsilon parameter, is there, are there such stationary distributions? You add an epsilon parameter, uh, sorry, wait. But just like in, in the equation that you're studying, which has the leading order correction, is there an analog of a Maxwellian? Yeah, the Mac, it's still the Maxwellian. It's still the Maxwellian. Yeah, there's some symmetries popping out that cancel everything. So, so to lead, so in, at what order would you expect to see something different then? Uh, I would say that all order the corrections are, are, are sort of linear in, in how far you go away from, from equilibrium. Other questions? Not from here. I guess given how uh, late it is in Geneva, it's in everybody's uh, interest if we uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. I would like to thank all the participants for their beautiful talks and uh, for the patience of uh, sitting so late through them. <laughs>